But I speak to you, right? This is this is only for the camera. This is only for YouTube, actually. This is just for the okay, perfect. Primary one. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's what he says on the Harvard bookstore website. Or maybe they can change it. <laughs> 
Welcome, everybody. Hello. Hello. Hello, Hello everybody. Hello, Brisa. Hello. <laughs> okay, before we start, I have a couple of announcements. Um, Professor Gates has already told you about his conversation with Susan Rice today at 7.30 <laughs> on the occasion of her book, Tough Love, My Story of the Things Worth Fighting For. Next week, we'll have a three-part um, lecture series, the Huggins Lecture Series, um, entitled Ancient Africa in World History, Invention, Innovation, Impact. And this, this series will be delivered by Christopher Errett. Um, more information details are on the flyer next to the door. Next week's colloquium will be delivered by Tracy Parker, and she'll be speaking on Beyond Loving, Sex, Love, and Marriage in the Black Freedom Movement. Now today, it is my great pleasure to introduce Jorge Felipe Gonzalez at the Du Bois Colloquium. He recently, actually this past summer, received his PhD in history from Michigan State University. Um, the title of his dissertation is Foundation and Growth of the Cuban-Based Transatlantic Slave Trade, 1790-1820. Generally, his scholarship focuses on factors underpinning the emergence of the Cuban-based transatlantic slave trade at the turn of the 19th century. By reassessing quantitative slave commerce between Cuba and Western Africa, his research explores the means by which Cuban-based merchants planters, and colonial authorities built the infrastructure necessary for this slave trade route. While in, while in Havana, he managed a slavery study group directed by Maria del Carmen Garcia and Mario Iglesias. The group, with the support of the Du Bois Institute, which was what Hutchins was back then, developed the digital database project, Traces of Slavery. The project centered on the creation of a searchable database to facilitate the description and quantification of information about Cuban slaves, including their identities and ethnic backgrounds. During the past several years, while pursuing his doctoral studies, he has collaborated on important projects in his areas of specialization. And these include the transatlantic and intra-American slave trade databases, the online site Slave Biographies, and the Hutchins Center's Cuba and the United States in the Atlantic Slave Trade, 1789 to 1820, which he co-directs with Maria Iglesias. He has written numerous articles in such significant journals as the Journal of Global Slavery and Espacio Laico. And as a fellow of the Du Bois Research Institute, Jorge Philippe will be partnering with David Altus, the renowned historian of the early modern Atlantic on the project, People of the Atlantic Slave Trade, a new section of the existing transatlantic slave trade, base, trade database. Funded by the Mellon Foundation, the Hutchins Center, and bringing together the work of several scholars, this will provide access to data on individuals such as owners of slaving expeditions, captains, and financiers, and will create a digital foundation for reframing questions about slavery and freedom in the Atlantic world. He's the recipient of many honors, including the Harry Brown Graduate Fellowship in American History from Michigan State University, and the fellowship from the Ibero-American Institute in Berlin. In addition, he has been awarded research grants from Harvard, Michigan State University's Humanities Center, and the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies at Michigan State. And so please welcome Jorge Gonzalez as he presents Foundation and Growth of the Cuban-Based Transatlantic Slave Trade, 1790-1820. <laughs> Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you all for being here. Um, thank you, Krishna, for your kind introduction. Um, I want to thank, uh, in particular, the Hutchins Center, um, Dr. Gates. Uh, this project that I will be presenting today actually was born in Havana, Cuba, uh, when I was working a project with Maria Iglesias and Maria Carmen Barcia. And the Hutchins Center, in particular, Professor Gates, helped to this project substantially when we were working there. Um, 
I would like to say thank also uh, my co-advisor, David Otis, and my advisor, Walter. There is one question that I would like to thank. Um, many years ago, actually 18 years ago, I was 19 and I was a freshman in college. And I had this professor of history of philosophy who took me to the archive for the first time. And she, she taught me everything about the archive, how to work with documents, what can I do, uh, the new historiographical trends. He introduced me to most of the people I know. And I have been work, working with her uh, since then. And actually this project is hard for me to differentiate what comes from me and what comes from her. And she's Maria Iglesia. And I would like to actually <laughs> thank you for everything. And it means, it means the, the word uh, for me that you're here. It's the first time actually, after all these years that you are going to see me presenting. And I hope, <laughs> and I, hope I, I do a good work. The, the last time you see me presenting, I was 19, presenting something about Aristotle or Plato probably, or Hegel, who knows. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> many years ago. So let's, let's go on it. Um, so Cuba, 1926. The former Spanish possession has been an independent nation for 24 years. The president, Gerardo Machado, is a general for, from the latest anti-colonial revolution who is moving toward changing the constitution and becoming one of the cruelest dictators in the history of the island. The prices of sugar in the global market are soaring, for which Cuba is experiencing a period of economic development. The capital, Havana, is expanding. The wealthy are moving toward the western side of the city, building new suburban spaces. A new neighborhood is born, El Vedado. Unlike colonial Havana, El Vedado has wide streets, groves, and modern buildings. The urban style is closer to New York than to Barcelona. El Vedado, for the pleasure of its new inhabitant, is mostly white and affluent. That summer of 1926, a new mansion is added to the neighborhood. That house is the talk of the growing bourgeois community. The mostly known Cuban architects, actually the best architects in Cuba, those who designed Havana's capital, Evelio Bobantes and Felix Cavarrocas, conceived its eclectic style. The facade resembled Florentine palaces guarded by two sculpted lions. Let us go inside the house. The interiors combine Neolithic and Egyptian motifs. The staircases are made of Carrara marble with railing laminated with silver. Fine sand from the Nile River coats the wall. A polished Languedoc marble floor combines symmetric shapes in gray and red. A stained glass window crafted by the best glass maker at the time, Jules Lalique, adorns the wall facing the main entrance. Jean-Claude Nicolas Forestier the designer of the gardens of the Champ de Mars below the Eiffel, Eiffel Tower did the gardens. The mansion was built by Juan, Juan Pedro Baró, the owner of several sugar factories, land, real estate, and other industries. It was a wedding gift for his wife, Catalina de Laza. The couple not only shared the wedding rings, the exquisite finish of the mansion, the cara marbles, the impeccable glasswork of La Lique, the design of Covantes and Cavarrocas, or the gardens by Forestier. They had in common an uns unspoken heritage. Pedro was the grandson of Jose Baró Blanchard, a renowned 19th century slave trader, a slave owner, and sugar planter. Catalina descended from an even more Asian pedigree. She was the great granddaughter of Sebastián de Laza, the man who organized the first successful slave trading expedition from Cuba to Africa in 1792. The family history was tied with the past of enslavement of Africans. This genealogy, however, was common among the Cuban elite at the turn of the 20th century. Most of the wealth existing back then in Cuba, growth of Havana, railroads, streets, buildings, universities, theaters, aqueducts, and cultural and scientific scene, scene expanded in tandem with the economic growth that sugar provided. As politicians from the island used to say, there is no country without sugar. Sugar had been at the center of the Cuban economy since the late 18th century. By the 1830s, the island was the world leading sugar producer. As it happened to other major crops in the Americas intended for the global market, such as cotton, cocoa, tobacco, or coffee, sugar expanded in tandem with the enslavement of Africans and their descendants. The economic growth that Cuba experienced since the late 18th century and the expansion of a slave society are the direct sources of the wealth as families such as the Baró and the Laza. If asked, Catalina Laza and Pedro Baró would have told you what the social class wanted and conveniently needed to believe, that although the system was wrong, 
Africans were better off in Cuba than in their barbaric homelands, that only black people were able, able to endure the hard work on the sugar plantations, that masters treated their, their slaves as members of the family, that the slavery in Cuba was never as harsh as in the United States or the British colonies, that if there was someone to blame for the slavery and the slave trade, that was Spain. Furthermore, they would have told you that their slaving forefathers did what was considered normal at their time. This and many other similar myths can be found by the numbers in any slave society in the Americas. Although enslavement, slavery, and other forms of coercion have been the norm in the history of humanity and not the exception, the modern Western elite felt compelled to justify bondage. Perhaps because, as Orlando Patterson has persuasively argued, Western concepts of personal and societal freedoms emerged from the experience of slavery as masters, slaves as non-slaves. By justifying, experiencing, and responding to slavery, individual freedom emerged as a compelling vision of life. Not surprisingly, in the 19th century, when slaves had opened their path to liberty in Haiti and the abolitionist movement expanded, there were more reasons than ever to justify slavery and the slave trade in Cuba. Cuba, indeed, had the longest slave trade in history in the Americas. It started in the early 16th century and ended in 1866 when the last slave ship was captured, 1866. It resulted in around 980,000 slaves being brought to the island, almost a million. To put this number in perspective, the United States, a nation substantially bigger, received about 400,000 slave Africans. Cuba, more than double US numbers. Another peculiar feature of the Cuban slave trade is that it reached its historical peak in the 19th century. 87% of the slaves disembarked in Cuba arrived after 1790. The late incorporation of Cuba in the transatlantic slave trading system was not, however, an anomaly. The expansion of slavery and the slave trade during the 19th century is part of a war historical process conceptualized by historian Del Tomish as the second slavery. After the 1780s and most of the following century, a redeployment and expansion of Atlantic slavery and the formation of highly productive new zones of slave commodity production took place in the United States, Brazil, and Cuba. These relocations are at the heart of the history of the expansion of human trafficking in the island. The origins. <clears throat> On August 5, 1792, a brigantine carrying 227 slave Africans from Senegambia arrived in Havana. The owner of the expedition, Sebastián de Laza, the great-grandfather of Catalina, became a local celebrity. Colonial authorities referred to him in official documents as a patriot, a role model, and an expert on the Atlantic slave trade. The most influential men in Havana welcomed him to their social homes, to their homes and social gatherings. The governor of Cuba, Don Luis de las Casas, addressed an enthusiastic letter to the Spanish king, Charles IV, commending the tenacity of, Land of Lassa, he said, who had raised, he said, the flag of Spain in a business practiced only by foreigners. The king himself congratulated Lassa and granted him several awards. Why was there so much excitement for the arrival of a slave ship in a city that has been receiving captives for three centuries? Why was an ordinary slave trader praised so much in Havana? To answer this question, we need to go back in time. For most of its colonial history, Africans had arrived in Cuba on Portuguese, Dutch, French, or British vessels. By the 18th century, the Spanish Empire, or like most European powers, did not own African slave trading outposts in sub-Saharan Africa. Spain lacked officers and sailors knowledgeable on the transatlantic slave trade. There were no commercial networks between Spanish and African-based merchants. There was not a slave trading, financial, legal, or commercial infrastructure. Cuba brought the Spanish flag to Africa, and Sebastián de Laza was, indeed, a pioneer. Between 1790 and 1820, however, when Spain banned the transatlantic slave trade, Cuba had displaced a distinctive slave trading business. Merchants on the island owned a slaving fleet. Experienced sailors, captains, and pilots from all over the Atlantic world were in Havana, waiting for the next slave ship to sell to Africa. Cuban merchants had established a slave trade outpost and trading networks along the African coast. How did this happen? How did Cuban merchants set up the infrastructure to conduct commercial operations in Africa? How did Cuban-based merchants build 
the financial, financial economic organization to trade the slave. How did owners, captains, or supercargos acquire expertise in the transatlantic slave trade? Where did Cuban merchants buy slave ships? How did Cubans set up commercial networks and slave trading outposts along the African coast? To answer these questions, I choose two central approaches, which I define as the top-down and the bottom-up. The top-down refers to the measure adopted by the Spanish colonial or imperial government, together with the elite, to be the leg legislative, political, and institutional framework in which Cuban slave traders operated for the ensuing decades. The bottom-up reconstructs from a microhistorical lens ordinary and daily steps taken on the ground by Cuban merchants, captains, and sailors to trade slaves in Africa. The top-down approach has been carefully developed by several historians, authors such as Howard Ames, Manuel Moreno Fraginales, Fraginales Jose Luciano Franco, Franklin Knight, Roland T. Lai, Maria del Carmen Barcia, Faye Iglesias, Leibert Gard, Herbert Klein, and Pablo Tornero, and many others, has success successfully pointed out the structural factors that made possible the development of a slave society and the slave trade in Cuba. What has remained mostly unanswered, however, is how Cuban merchants built from scratch a transatlantic slave trading business. With a few exceptions such as Marial Iglesias, Manuel Barcia, Leonardo Marquez, or Guadalupe Ortega, the historiography is slim when it comes to addressing the microhistorical factors that made, it, that made it possible for Cubans to reach the African coast. Top-down approach, the creation of infrastructure. In February 1789, the Spanish king liberalized the importation of slaves to his colonies for any nation in peace with Spain. Immediately, French, British, Dutch, Danish, American, and even German slavers went to Cuba loaded with chain Africans. The new law was a significant incentive for the expanding sugar economy in Cuba. A set of international transformation also played a significant role in favoring the Cuban slave trade during the beginning of what Eric Hosband has called the Age of Revolutions. The European wars in the aftermath of the French Revolution, the Napoleonic Wars, and the abolitionist movement are some of them. Cuban planters and merchants took advantage of the international instability to materialize their economic agenda. However, one event in particular sealed the fate of the island. In August 1791, African men and women, the Avengers of the New World, using Laurent Dubois' term, the Wa, revelled in the colony of Saint Domingue and led the most <coughs> radical social uprising in the Americas. The Haitian Revolution burned down the most prosperous sugar economic, economy of the globe. The hour of our happiness has arrived, proclaimed the spokesman of the Cuban planter and merchant class, Francisco Arango y Parreño. <laughs> Cuba became what historian Ada Ferrer called the freedom mirror. To the chance of liberty coming from Saint Domingue, Cuba reflected the distorted image of the expansion of the sugar plantation complex and the recrudescence of slavery and the slave trade. The hardening of slavery as a response to Haiti was, however, not exclusive to Cuba. The slaving elite in the United States, Brazil, and the British colonies reacted similarly. A ruthless slave, a slave machinery was set in motion in the island. Between 1790 and 1808, more than 12 pieces of legislation were passed favoring the slave trade. No more taxes had to be paid for the exportation or importation of products intended for the slave trade, including the acquisition of slave ships. Foreigners could operate for longer time in Cuba. Spanish slave ships could carry aboard a crew formed by foreigners. Silver could be exported. There was not any regulation at all regarding the condition of transportation of the slaves during the Middle Passage. Adams Smith doctrines were plain wrong. The first economic liberal measures in Cuba came back hand by hand, not with freedom, like he said, but with bondage and slavery. In the 1790s, several slave trading projects were discussed, an institution created to boost the plantation economy. The most important of them was the Royal Consulate of Agriculture and Commerce, founded in 1794, a sort of merchant guild that became the headquarters of the architects of the Cuban slavery. There, Cuban planters and merchants lobbied, discussed, and implemented many measures to accelerate the expansion of the sugar production in Cuba, to better exploit the enslaved African, to force them to be more machine-like. The Cuban elite lobbied the Spanish government to ease regulation for foreign slavers to bring captives to Cuba at competitive prices and, simultaneously, to encourage the participation of Cuban-based merchants in the transatlantic slave trade. 
Among the many strategies adopted were invitation to pioneer slave traders, such as Sebastián de Laza, to lecture on the business. In the Royal Consulate, the lead created the first maritime insurance company of Havana to protect mercantile investment, such as the slave trade. And they also discussed the establishment of a nautical school to train slave traders. While law were passed, institutions founded, and projects discussed, fewer merchants increased their involvement in the traffic on the ground on a daily basis. And I need water. <clears throat> um, Bottom-up approach, slavers on the ground. Over the past year, I have analyzed hundreds of records left behind by slave ship owners, captains, pilots, insurance company, customs, and legal court from archives in Cuba, the US, England, and Spain to understand daily operation of Cuban-based slave merchants. Cuban-based merchants, I found, lend the know-how of human trafficking from those who had been practicing it for decades, if not centuries, from British, American, Dutch, French, Portuguese, and Danish, aspiring, aspiring Cuban slave ship owners, captain, pilots, and supercargos, learned about merchandise for the trade, the Middle Passage, the treatment and control of the captives, negotiation, nego negotiations in Africa, or the prices and regions of operations. Furthermore, through established foreign slavers, Cubans were introduced into networks of traders in Africa. This, however, was a pattern in the foundation of the new branches of, the, of any transatlantic slave trade. Historian Jack Cotry has shown that after the American Revolution, US slave traders set up their business following British steps. There were different types of commercial activities that allowed Cuban merchants to gain expertise and establish Atlantic slave trade networks. Initially, <coughs> Cubans joined the slave trade as the owners of a small intra-American expedition across the Caribbean mostly to Jamaica, but also to Barbados, St. Thomas, and Curaçao. Indeed, before 1808, most of the slaves came to Cuba from other Caribbean colonies. Cuban merchants also served as agents or consignees of human cargoes carried by foreigners. Unless naturalized as Spanish subjects, foreigners could not sell the human cargo in any of the Spanish colonies. They needed agents or consignees. Merchants from the island also performed as figureheads for foreign investors aiming to lease or buy barracoons, houses, plantations, and commercial establishments in and around Havana. Cuban merchants function also as legal figures for foreigners to falsely use the Spanish flag for their slaving operations, especially during wars. Such interaction resulted in Cuban merchants acquiring a slave trading expertise, technology, and commercial networks. Thus, the first generation of Spanish slave ship captains was, train, was trained on foreign vessels. Aspiring Cuban slavers had to learn how to use the oceanic wind and currents to reach specific African ports, to establish trading contacts, learn the basic of other languages, manners, and under what terms to conduct the purchase of slaves. They had to know what type of merchandise was in demand, how to bargain, and to deal with the bureaucracy of every particular slave import. They needed to gain experience on how to keep the captives alive and at the same time, on their control during the Middle Passage. The most common strategy was to place Spanish apprentices on their foreign flag vessel, and years later, those apprentices were captains of a Cuban-owned expedition. Let us explore a single case. In 1795, Cuban-based merchant Luis Beltran Gonet hired William Montgomery, a native of Ireland but citizen, but citizen of the United States, to captain the slave ship Bonita, or Beauty. Montgomery was one of the many American slave traders operating in Cuba at the, in the 1790s. Gonet installed on the Bonita a Spanish supercargo from Cadiz, Jose Vriñas, with the explicit goal of learning the slave trading business from the American Montgomery. On April 20, 1795, after a two-month two journey from Liverpool, the Bonita arrived at Shaw Island in the Gambia River, where it loaded 113 slaves. The ship, however, was captured by the French, and the slaves were freed in Goree. By September 1795, the Bonita arrived in Havana empty or in ballast. For the second voyage of the Bonita, Gonet placed Jose Briñas as the captain, the former supercargo under Montgomery's mentorship. Briñas had not only learned how to manage the slave ship, but he had also established African connections in the Gambia during the previous voyage. Thus, the Bonita, not surprisingly, sailed again to Gambia this time under Brignas' command. 
During the following years, Brinas had a prosperous career as a slave ship captain. Two elements are critical to retain from this story. First, that Cuban-based slavers learn about foreign vessels. And second, that this allowed Cuban-based slavers to establish networks in Africa. I have found evidence that after visiting one slave port about a foreign commander expedition, the Spanish apprentice went back to the same port now as the captain of the vessel. Thus, my suggested methodology to understand the beginning of the operation of Cuban merchants in Africa to single is to single out the national variety of foreign slavery trading in Cuba and the African region of influence, and second, to examine the partnership those foreigners established with Cuban on a case-by-case -case basis. For instance, through Portuguese, Brazilian, and the British, some traders in Havana started commercial operations in some port in West Central Africa. However, I will focus in one particular case of the partnership established between US and Cuban slavers and how it made it possible for Cuban-based merchants to establish trading partnership in Africa. Let's go to the US, Cuba, the United States, Africa, and the transatlantic slave trade. By the 1790s, Rhode Island had emerged as the epicenter of human trafficking in the US. And Cuba, which just hoped opened his doors to foreigners to bring the slaves, became the leading destination of US slavers. As historian Jack Cotri and Leonardo Marquez have shown, it was common for Rhode Island slave trading families, such as the Wall or the Brown, to send slaves to the Spanish island. International factors also favored the US position in the Cuban slave market. During the aftermath of the French Revolution, Spain was often in war with England, which is, it was, the historical provider of a slave to Cuba. Though every time this happened, the US monopolized the Cuban slave trade. After Charleston reopened the transatlantic slave trade in 1803, the US influence over the US influence over the Cuban slave market reached unprecedented levels, partially because between 1803 and 1808, Americans imported one quarter of the total number of slaves entering the United States over the whole era of the slave trade. No other country involved in the traffic, David Eltis has argued, generated a pattern remotely like this one. After 1803, many captives were transshipped from Charleston to Cuba. The provision of a slave to the island relied so much upon the connection with Charleston that just in 1807, of the 504,000 slaves that disembarked in the island, 62% of them were reported as coming from Charleston. <clears throat> the US presence in the Cuban slave trade in the 1790s played a vital role in the creation of the Cuban-based transatlantic slave trade. Americans provided expertise, technologies, capital, and trading networks. Most importantly, US slavers linked their Cuban counterparts with a specific African slave markets. Let us take the case of the Upper Guinea coast to illustrate this transference. Upper Guinea is a geographical division employed by historian Philip Cortin to refer to the African region stretching from today from Senegal to Liberia, which is this area here. Long before its independence, the US had been trading slaves with the Upper Guinea region. The maritime currents, geographical proximity, inherited network from the British, and, as some historians like Judith Carney argues, the expertise of the slave from these regions in rice production explain this connection. Commerce between the United States and Upper Guinea increased after Charleston opened his door to the importation of a slave in 1803. During those late years of the US slave trade, Charleston was the leading destination of the slave leaving Upper Guinea, as historians such as Walter Rodney, Bubakar Barry, and George Brooke has shown. However, after 1808, Cuba was the leading destination of the slave departing Upper Guinea. How did this happen? In 1808, England and the United States made the transatlantic slave trade illegal. Some American slave traders did not give up their business. No, no, no. Instead, they moved their operation to Cuba, bringing with them decades of experience, technology, and commercial networks. Others moved to Africa and continued trading with Cuba. This process, which can be called as a relocation of slave trading networks in the North Atlantic, is the core of the foundation of the second slavery. In details, this relocation worked in the following manner. In Havana, Americans registered their vessels 
the, the ships nominally as a Spanish property by using a Cuban-based merchant figurehead. Then they said to Africa on their Spanish papers, and by going back and forth between Africa and Havana, they established new transatlantic routes. We know about it because of the record left behind by the several ships captured by the British and condemned in Freetown, which has been previously, previously explored by historians such as Maria Iglesias, Manuel Barcia, Henry Lofier, and many others. These documents show that over time, after a period of learning and transfer, Cubans took over the trading routes initially possessed by Americans. The internal process that happened in the Americas only partially explained how Cubans established trade in Upper Guinea. Conditions within Africa itself are also important. Now let's go to Africa. To narrow down my case and include the African factor in the creation of Cuban branch of the state trade, I will focus on a specific port in Upper Guinea known as Rio Pongo, which has been, I have been working on for a long time with Maria Iglesias. Rio Pongo is a conglomerate of small rivers located in today's country of Guinea Conakry. There we go. We know, in detail, um, uh, we know in detail about this African region, our Rio Pongo, thanks to the scholarship of late historian Bruce Mauser, and more recently, Maria Iglesias. As Barry and Rodney have argued, long-term migrations, polit relig long -term religious, political, economic migrations have been continually shaping the social composition of Upper Guinea, where Pongo is located, which is here. I'm sorry about that. After the collapse of the Empire of Ghana in the 13th century, there were successive migrations by the Susu, Bagas, Limbas, and Landumas from the Futa Yalon Plateau in the interior to the coastal areas such as Pongo. This is a, um, the Futa Yalon uh, Plateau is here, and here you can see Rio Pongo, this area here. So they are. Uh, fairly connected. Communities from the coast and the Futa Yalon Plateau created a slate trading corridor from the interior to the coast. A significant factor explaining the expansion of this corridor was the creation and enlargement of the centralized Islamic Fula theocratic state of Futa Yalon, today's Mali, since the second half of the 18th century. By expanding by warfare, Futa Yalon increased the number of captives that were sent to Rio Pongo, and from there, to the Americas. The expansion of Futa Yalon coincide, coincided with the last years of the British transatlantic slave trade and the growth of the Cuban slave trade. But this was not just a mere, a mere coincidence. These processes were indeed interrelated. Traders from Rio Pongo and Havana established a mutually beneficial slaving relationship. The final factor explaining the expansion of Rio Pongo is the creation of Freetown in 1808, 100 miles south, as the epicenter of the British efforts to suppress the slave trade. The relocation of slaving routes that took place in North America from centers to peripheries also happened in Upper Guinea. After 1808, many slave traders from, moved from Bans Island and surround, surrounding areas in Sierra Leone to Rio Pongo. Some Americans moved to Rio Pongo to trade with Cuba. As the demand and community of traders in Rio Pongo grew, more slaves arrived from Futa Yalon. Atlantic and African transformation coalesced. What I think is essential to highlight here is that the relocation of a slave network did not happen only within the Americas. It took place also in Africa. It was a process comprising the North Atlantic at large. Second, as many historians such as John Thornton, Mariana Candido, Walter Hoffman, or Roquinaldo Ferreira have argued, it is impossible to have a comprehensive understanding of any transatlantic slave trade without taking into consideration socioeconomic conditions within the particular African regions or port of study. But leaving the argument there, I would say, is not sufficient. As a sort of butterfly effect, what happened in Cuba also had that impact in Africa, as the Rio Pongo shows. By arguing that historical processes in the Americas were connected to changes in Africa, I subscribe here to historians such as Christine Mann, Robin Law, Jose Curto, Candido Ferreira, and many others. Since there was more slave demand, and this is the argument, the community of traders in Pongo expanded. Frequent competition among those merchants amplified divisions, tensions, and confrontations. African landlords in regions without a centralized political entity got involved in the disputes. 
which resulted in even more political fragmentation. The British from Freetown, on the other hand, used this conflict to advance their two-headed Janus, uh, Janus agenda, on one side, abolishing the slave trade while expanding political control in Africa. The British attacked Pongo several times, and with every attack, Africans lost power. It is still unknown if the increase of the slave trade with Cuba modified the slaving practices, legal punishment, or warfare within Futa alone. And this is the last section, the birth of the Cuban-based transatlantic slave trade, 1808-1820. <clears throat> After 1808, Cubans increased their slaving fleet, African networks, and slaving expertise. They took control over Atlantic circuits such as Rio Pongo and Havana. By 1815, it can be argued that the Cuban-based transatlantic slave trade had fully emerged. Vessels condemned at the Vice Admiralty Court in Freetown show a higher ratio of Spanish ownership, crew, and financing than in previous years. Although the Cuban slave trade remained heavily transnational in the years to come, as historian John Harris has shown, Cuban merchants became the main protagonists and decision makers. Let's go to numbers. Between 1815 and 1820, when Spain abolished the slave trade, the Cuban slave trade reached unprecedented levels. In those five years, around 150,000 slaves disembarked on the island, more than the total in the two centuries before 1790s. Just in 1817, to make this case, Cuban imported, Cubans imported approximately 40,000 captives one year, even though uh, and a number that we can compare to the 48,000 that arrived in Brazil in the same years, even though Brazil's is many times the size of Cuba. Hmm? 74 times bigger. <laughs> Incredible big. <laughs> you see that? <laughs> Further, we know that in this period, Cuban-based traders had already established the first factories on the African coast. Let us analyze with one case the establishment of a Cuban slave trading outpost in Africa. Let's go back to Africa. In 1815, Cubans hired a Connecticut trader named Jacob Favor, who had previously lived in Pongo, to manage a factory in southern Sierra Leone, a region known as Gallinas. Gallinas, another conglomerate of rivers, became an important region for the slave trade only after the British abolished its commerce and traders moved their operation to peripheral regions. When Faber arrived at Gallinas, there was a civil war going on between two different political factions from the same ethnic group, the Bai, to take control of the emerging Atlantic slave trading market. The letters written by Faber while in Gallinas, today available in the Cuban National Archive, show Cuban involvement in this African political affair. Faber often requested weapons to his superiors in Havana to support one of the sides in the fight. The result was the triumph of King Chaka, a Bai leader from the Pasi Masakui clan. Resources coming from Cuba, in some, had helped to the creation of a small African state. The insight that the slave trade contributed to the expansion of some African state is actually not new. Historians such as Martin Klein has been talking about it for decades. It is, however, the first time that this is analyzed from the Spanish perspective of human trafficking. During the following years, Cuba, became the leading destination of a slave leaving the kingdom of Gallinas. After Faber, Faber left Gallinas in 1819, this is a trade from Gallinas, you can see the main destination is Cuba, but after Faber left Gallinas in 1819, he was substituted by a Spaniard under the name of Pedro Blanco, a perfect example of transfer to Cuban ownership. Blanco, together with King Chaka, was responsible for sending to Havana the slave that in 1839, revolted on the schooner Amistad. The rebels were declared free by the US Supreme Court in 1841 and returned to their homeland. In sum, in just 30 years, Cuban-based merchants created a new branch of the transatlantic slave trade. It resulted from a process of Atlantic changes that began at the end of the 18th century. Through the many foreign slavers that came to the island, Cubans were able to establish a slave trading partnership in Africa. Through Americans, in particular, the Cuban merchant class connected with their African counterparts in the Upper Guinea port, such as Rio Pongo and Gallinas. Both regions established a mutually beneficial relationship, and changes on one side of the ocean were often reflected on the other. <clears throat>
<clears throat> for almost five decades after 1820, and under condition of illegality, the Cuban elite ignored any international, political, moral, and religious pressure to stop trading and enslaving Africans. The last known transatlantic slave ship arrived in Cuba in 1866. Slavery would last for 20 years more until 1888. Thus, 86, sorry. Thus, by the turn of the 20th century, there were thousands of Africans in Cuba who remember not only their life as a slave, but also the atrocious experience they had to endure in the bottom of a slave ship. Epilogue. In 1962, 1962, Nina Pedro, the last inhabitant of Catalina and Pedro's mansion in El Vedado, abandoned Cuba forever. She was part of thousands of wealthy people living a country they no longer recognize. Three years before Nina fled the country, a group of young, bearded revolutionaries had taken control of the island after a civil war to expel a bloody dictator and restore democracy. However, the country quickly moved to a totalitarian mode of governance copied from the Soviet Union. There was no space for Nina, and even less for what her bourgeois house represented in this new proletarian Cuba. The keys of the mansion ended up in the hands of one of the many bureaucrats ordered by the new revolutionary government to trace and catalog the properties of the wealthy family who fled the island. In 1970, the mansion was transformed into the Cuban Soviet Friendship Institute. That's an <laughs> irony. <laughs> The decision was symbolic, showing that the government wanted to raise everything that the house represented. To this day, anyone can visit the mansion to have a drink in a poorly stocked bar on the patio, rent a room for a party, or pay one dollar to take a picture of the place. <laughs> <laughs> the gardens, despite a forest here, are now partially covered by a stage where Cubans musicians play salsa, reggaeton, or other Cuban rhythm people that otherwise would have been barred from even reaching the porch of the house are now its administrator and visitor. Justice, some could say, has been served. Thank you so much. Hello, Jorge, that was, um, obviously I live with these statistics, <laughs> literally. <laughs> <clears throat> and I've known him for nine years since you were a Marielle student. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I know that um, many of your minds are spinning with this cascade of surprising um, facts. The, um, the fact that in that short period between 1803 and 1808, what did you say, 24% of all the Africans who came to the United States yes were important because they knew the wall was coming down, the curtain was coming down, right? Everybody knew the slave trade. You know, when I was an undergraduate, I couldn't get a straight Cornell between slavery and the slave trade. You know, I thought they kept talking about the slave trade being abolished in 1808, but then there was an Emancipation Proclamation. You know, that's how dumb I was. But it, Britain abolished it in 1807, then the United States in, in 1808. So <clears throat> there are all these things happening, which you just, um, mapped out so beautifully. First of all, the richest colony in the history of the world was San Domingue, which became Haiti. When, when Dessalines, because remember, Louverture is tricked, so he's dying <coughs> in a prison in France. It was Jean-Jacques Dessalines who kicked Napoleon's army's ass, and he was a mean dude. But when all this, if all this money is being made, you think that capitalists or anybody's just gonna say, Oh my God, we just gotta stop making money. How many miles, Marielle, is it between Haiti and Cuba? 50 miles. They just moved 50 miles. They moved the whole slave apparatus 50 miles to Cuba. And as he so graphically um, displayed, it just went crazy. Uh, you know, and then Cuba, uh, astonishing fact number three, Cuba got two and a half times as many slaves as the United States. And 20% as many as Brazil, though, as Marielle said, Brazil is 74 times um, larger. Brazil got 5 million Africans. Cuba got 1 million. We got 388,000. 
The other thing he saw is that though people, don't, black Americans especially, are embarrassed about this fact. I was, people tried to lynch me in 1998. But now it's just, even in children's books, it's very well established that the slave trade was a conspiracy between European elites and African elites. That's just a fact, everyone. I'm sorry, but it's a fact. A maximum of 10% of the Africans captured in the slave trade were captured by white people sneaking up on your great, great, great grandparents and throwing a net around. They were, um, uh, there were wars between kingdoms, mm -hmm. warring states. And Futa Jalan, there were war in the Islamic. Um, there were huge jihads going on at this time. That's why you so beautifully sketched out. There are these moving parts, these balls in the air. The is Islamic kingdoms are fighting with each other over what true Islam is. And as soon as they defeated them, they put them on, their, 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 on these slave ships and their enemies and sent them to the new world. The one thing you left out, with, uh, and I filmed on Bunce Island for Many Rivers to Cross, but I don't know all about Pongo because of Bruce Mouser and, and Mary Ellen. I wrote a column for my root column, which became you know, 100 Amazing Facts About the Negro, is the mulatto class. These African chiefs would make or force or encourage the European traders. Now remember, Europeans didn't penetrate the African um, continent for a long time, that's why Stanley and Livingston was such a big deal. Europeans were only in these little forts along the coast, waiting on Africans to bring, bring the slaves down the river after they had captured them. And many of the African chiefs, Cornell, made the Europeans marry into their families. And they created, tell them about it, they created a class of mulatto slave traders that were the sons of the original white slave traders and the daughter of the chief. Mm -hmm. And then the sons became the slave trade. And there's a whole class of mulattoes and accrued mulatto wealth all through West Africa. Mm -hmm. um, and even, there's a story about one even went to Havana to get his property back. <laughs> and Marielle's written about him. What's his name? Uh, John, John Ormond. Yes, John Ormond. John Ormond Jr. And I wrote about him, and you wrote about him. But they were mulatto. They show up at a van and he goes, I want my, my property back. <laughs> and they go, get your black ass out of here. You're not even a human being. But he won. But he won. So the slave trade, we, we've, because it's the worst thing, one of the worst things happened in human history, and certainly profoundly has shaped every black and white American uh, since then, we constructed a very simple, almost melodramatic story about it. But the complexity makes it all the more interesting. It, it doesn't t take away the argument for reparations or whatever, but you have to tell the truth about it. The Times in their 1619 thing made two mistakes. One, slavery didn't start in the United States in 1619. The first black person got here in 1513, and the first slave rebellion is in 1526. The second thing they did, they created this puff piece uh, inset on Queen Nzinga and representing her like Harriet Tubman. Queen Nzinga sold 50,000 Africans. She sold her kingdom, 50,000 Africans. Where you, and read, Linda Haywood is a black woman who uses it, sits in this room. She has written a letter to the editor, which at the time still, I wrote to Dean my, uh, uh, my cat, my friend, I go, you got to correct this. They promised they were going to publish her letter, but I don't know if they have or not. She was one of the biggest slave traders in the history of the slave trade. So they tell a story like she courageously fought against the Portuguese. That's because th she was cutting deals with the Portuguese and the Dutch in order to keep her kingdom to keep slavery flowing mm -hmm. and fought wars to get other Africans to you know, to keep her wealth, et cetera, et cetera. This is the real deal. And what that brother just did was lay it out in such a way that none of us w knew 20 years ago, uh, even, thanks to the cumulative research of uh, Mary Al, David Eltis, and, uh, and uh, Jorge Felipe. I, I just wanted you to give it up again for what he just did. It, it was a master. Final, final thing, 48% of all the Africans, our African ancestors, overall came through Charleston. Um, Charleston is our Ellis Island. Didn't last one. 
But overall, when you, because of the last wave, when you add it up, half of the Africans that came to the United States came through the port of Charleston. Astonishing. Questions, comments? Brother Corn. <laughs> no, no, we, uh, I just want to say that uh, this is one of the most brilliant pieces I've seen in historiography in a long time. It's a tribute to our dear sister Maria, but also yourself. Thank you. You're just such a superb historian. And the idea of a superb philosopher shaping a superb historian. Now, she does wonderful historian work herself, but she's a philosopher. <laughs> you know what I mean? That, that's a rare thing, that you would have somebody who's reading Plato and Aristotle and then going to the archives <laughs> and, and coming to terms with, with slave history. But my question is this, though, brother, and it's a personal question, that the vanguard work that you all are doing, the story of Arthur, the brother Skip just noted, just how do you come to terms with the depth and scope of the brutality and bestiality and barbarity of your subject matter and still retain some kind of capacity to affirm human beings doing the right thing. And this goes back to 1959. You get a great breakthrough, and then lo and behold, here come new structures of domination again. Here comes the greed again. Here comes the subordination again. Here comes the subjection again. So this is a kind of personal but philosophical question, given the magnificent and masterful work that you and the that Mariel and others have done in terms of trying to come to terms with the truth of our history, mm -hmm. which is an indictment of a whole lot of folk, mm -hmm. not just a little small sliver of folk that Skip was talking about. So that's, <laughs> that's probably the hardest question I've ever been asked, and it's very fascinating because I, I have thought about it many times. Um, I think when I start working on this subject, I clearly at the beginning of everything, I was uh, new, fresh on it. I started reading this as a sort, I don't know if I did this as a sort of self-protection, but as a fiction. I, I read the documents, and at the beginning it was like no, no full engagement. Over time, those documents were consuming more and more and more. And I think that's one of the reasons, the fact that this is so painful uh, to think about it because it, it makes you question the human nature. It makes you question the motive of history, what people do, what they do. And when you don't have a simple vision of the slave trade, when you have these people who are good and these people who are bad, or this manichaean uh, vision, when everything is so complex, it's harder for you to have like, where, what is the right thing here? Um, and that's why probably I, I would say, if you, if you notice my presentation doesn't talk about the slaves. I have been talking about the slave traders. These are the, the slave traders. And these are the movement of them, the connection they establish. A slave traders in Africa, but also a slave traders in Cuba, and the United States, and I think that one of the th reasons why it's missing the life of the slave is precisely because it's too painful. And I read that, and I, I guess that that's something that event I eventually, working on my dissertation, one chapter, I want to include this. And also the numbers. The numbers help you to keep the sort of a cold mind, like numbers and figures. Uh, but when I work on specific life stories, then when things get real. And yeah, I, I, I really don't have a clear answer for that. Because I'm at myself, I'm struggling with that. Yeah. Should I go? Uh, hi, Jorge. Thank you for the interesting talk. So I would like to know if you have idea about the average age of the slaves that were brought to Cuba in oh. that period, the life expectancy, for example. Mm -hmm. So it's something that it, it is interesting to me <coughs> in order to, uh, to be related with my own research. Right. Yeah. Um, regarding the, the average of the slate that we brought to Cuba, that, that changed over time. And it changed over time because conditions within Africa changed, and they were the main providers of the slave. So they decided what type of slave they were going to sell. They were, they, they were going to sell kids. They were going to sell more women. But in general, the age average goes between the 20 and the 30 years old. But at the end of the period, when the slave trade abolished, Cuba had the longest, Cuba had the hi highest ratio of child slavery in the Atlantic world. There is one case that Maria Iglesia has worked on, the Jesus Maria, where 98% of everyone, except one person, I think, 
four adults. Four adults of like 500 something slaves, they were. Most of the slaves were between six and 13. Between six and 13, and that, that, that was uh, something peculiar in Cuba. And there are many explanations we can find for that. One is because they, they wanted these kids, so it was the end of the slave trade, so they, they can't work longer period of time because the life expectancy was low. Uh, also because we can explain that from the African side of the story, why they are selling these kids. And that depends from the regions. There are regions in Upper Guinea that sell more kids than others. Um, and regarding life expectancy, it's estimated, although we don't have clear data about it, that around 10% of the, of the slaves died during the Middle Passage. To make the case clear, it's like if you are going from, from here to Spain, Spirit or any airline, <laughs> for you say worse, and they have 200 people, 20 of them probably would die for reaching its destination. So that's around 10% of all the slaves that right to Cuba. Life expectancy, that's something that needs to be researched, but something that is clear, Maria talked about it a lot, is that while in the United States you have this natural growth that happened with this 400,000 turned to five, six millions, in Cuba happened the opposite. So they were dying and there was a natural reproduction, which is, if there is any, a clear argument why slavery in Cuba was harsher, I know uh, has, people want to believe or other historians have argued that was harsher than in the United States, that's a good example, for example. The sugar we, plantation, they were dying. What, the, the, the number he's referring to is the 1860 federal census. A year before the outbreak of the Civil War, there were 4.4 million black people in the United States. 3.9 were enslaved. Those 388,000 mm -hmm. grew by 1860 to 3.9 million, mm -hmm. and overall to 4.4 million. Mm -hmm. They multiplied by 10. They multiplied, by, and in Cuba, they just worked them to death and replaced them like spark plugs. Exactly. I don't even know cars still have spark plugs. I tell my students that they look at me like you, I don't, you know, or like light bulbs. It was cruel. Yeah. Yeah, it was a machine to kill humans. So my question is how this horrible picture match with the idea that we have in Cuba uh, that, uh, you know, slavery was not that bad, that uh, slave, because the Spanish law had access to manumission, mm -hmm. quartacion. Mm -hmm. After the abolition, we got a kind of racial paradise. We don't have races to, until today. So how we put that? picture, uh, the slave trade, the numbers, the people dying, the highest rate of children involved mm -hmm. in the slave mm -hmm. trade, next to right, yeah, yeah. It's fascinating. beautiful picture of no race, right. we are Cubans, we are all equal, Ooh, blah, I, blah, blah. Yeah. <laughs> I believe uh, one of the first history of Cuba that was done in Cuba in the 18th century, you know, the 1760 uh, uh, Martin Feliz Zarrate, I, I found reference of how he justified slavery. And he was also the first time he was saying that the slavery in Cuba wasn't that harsh. That somehow there was a sort of paternal relationship between the slave and their masters. But that guy, the historians, as all the historians in the 19th century were the descendants of slave traders. <laughs> they were writing their own history. And you know what is even wrong that that story became the foundational history of the nation. And that story reached the 20th century. And then Cuba became independent. And when they wanted to write the new history of Cuba, where, they, where did they go? To these books. I have a second uh, question. Okay. You know, looking at that house, the picture of Nina Pedro, mm -hmm. the descendant leaving Cuba, it, it was in 1960, mm -hmm. I guess, uh, 1959. Uh, do you think that the Cuban Revolution, what happened in 1959, was a, case, a reparation case? Kind of, uh, you know, I, I, I read that uh, in an article, an article. that if we can find an uh, example of reparation is Cuba because they took all the money mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. rich people had and mm -hmm. they made the money out of sugar and sugar mm -hmm. was made out of blood. So even not wanting it, uh, the outcome, it's reparation. So right. what do you think about that? Um, but the, the last epilogue about the history of the house and Nina is a sort of allegory to that. To the house was confiscated. It became a public institution. It, everyone can visit now. And the owners, the descendants of the slave traders and the slaver in Cuba, they had to flee. They, had, they went to Miami where they built their own white Cuban version. Their own, their own white version of Cuba in Miami. Um, and I think that the revolution can be read as a form of reparations. 
because there was a redistribution of wealth. Uh, all these properties, sugar mills, uh, real estate was confiscated, and so how the money was distributed. Now, what happened with that revolution after? How it worked, if it was functional or not, that's another part of the story. But I think, I think it was some form um, of reparation, I would say. Hi, Jorge. Uh, first, I'd like to thank you for the, the presentation. I agree with everyone here. I'd like to present two questions. You have been using the concept of second slavery, mm -hmm. which refers to a kind of more dynamic, uh, more productive form of slavery in the 19th century. Uh, you presented numbers of the slave trade. Uh, there's an increase on the numbers of the slave trade, but I'm thinking, is there any qualitative change in the slave trade that would allow you to think of kind of a second slave trade, the same way we think of a second slavery? And the second question would be, uh, you present something really interesting about how Africa is changing during this process and how uh, it's connected to the slave trade and to Cuba. Mm -hmm. uh, the same period you studied the most, the early 19th century, is when the biggest slave revolts happen in Cuba. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you have found uh, like uh, information from Africa that w would allow you to understand some of the ethnical okay. basis of the slave rebellion in Cuba in the same period. Right. Um, so um, the, is this graphic here is uh, taken from the Transatlantic Slave Trade Database, a project that I show uh, knowledge um, even more. This is, the, this is the greatest digital project that uh, I have seen, not because I have worked with that or my, David Ellis is my co-advisor, but because this project has changed substantially how we understand the transatlantic slave trade. So this number comes from there. And as you can see, the period that you call, that Dave Thomas called the second slavery after the 1780s, show an increase in the transatlantic slave trade, not only, not only in Cuba, which is the blue line, but also in particular in, in Brazil, where you have the, the uh, orange line. So yeah, there is a connection. I don't know, I I don't know if I would use uh, the term uh, second slave trade, probably could work. Um, I don't think, for example, David Otis would be uh, on board with that term, but um, because more a continuity. Um, so yeah, I think that there is a spike, clearly there is a spike. So that clearly there is something different in the 19th century going on. If the term can be defined or not, that's, that's a good question. The second one about rebellions, I, I cannot, I have not worked on it, but I, can, I know there are historians that have worked on it, like Manuel Barcia. Manuel Barcia has his book, Seas of Direction, where he works on the connection between a rebellion that took place in Matanz in the 1820s and transformation that were going on in Africa, inspired by your race, this uh, book on the rebellion that took place in Brazil. Um, he was inspired that changed completely our mind because the concept is that some things that were happening in Africa, conflicts, those slaves brought that with them to the Americas. They had not only, they had the expertise as a fighters, they were warriors, many of them. So they somehow, that experience helped them to participate in slave rebellions or lead slave rebellions in, in the Americas. And in Cuba, that is the case, but I haven't worked on it yet. Um, um, thank you for this presentation. Um, I had a question. You know, you're looking at 1790, 1820, so that's about, like 1820, it's um, about close to 10 years, perhaps 10 years after the British ended the slave trade and three years after the 1817 convention. And mm -hmm. so I, you know, had a question regarding um, the effect of uh, the policing of the traffic on the Cuban trade, um, you know, in terms of like the dynamic of it, mm -hmm. like some of the resistance in terms of apprehension of slave ships and how the traffickers responded, how it affected um, the age um, um, of the uh, uh, Africans. Um, um, so, yeah. Um, yeah, the, the, the abolition of the transatlantic slave trade is a rupture moment for the Cuban slave trade. The Cuban slave trade took off precisely because all the major slave traders, and in this case the British, in the North Atlantic abandoned the business. So the Cubans took uh, position of that, took control of that. Uh, the, the Royal Navy that was established in Freetown after 18 away with the Vice Admiralty Courts and then with Mixed Commission Court, they'd capture uh, so many ships that in total resulted in around 60,000 slaves being liberated in Havana and Freetown, which is a, a significant number. And it shapes substantially the, the, some of the direction of the transatlantic slave trade, because while the British were uh, patrolling this northern zone of Upper Guinea, 
That means that traders from Cuba had to move southern and southern. That's why probably at the end of the transatlantic slave trade, there are so many slaves coming from the area of Mozambique. So there, there was an effect of the patrolling and the, the roots of the transatlantic slave trade. And it also had an effect within those coastal regions in Africa because it helped to the British to take control of this area, this guys under the abolition of the transatlantic slave trade and establish their own fusion colonies. Ooh, this is heavy. <laughs> is it her? <laughs> yeah, it's very heavy. Thank you for your work. And your work, too. Um, yeah, my question is, I didn't understand until today that, you know, the youth aspect, the children from 6 to 13, and it, um, I asked um, Sinclair about it last week in his work, too. We know that there's human trafficking that's happening now, mm -hmm. enslavement, as well as sexual human trafficking and pedof like worldwide wide rings of pedophilia. So I don't know, have you done any research around pedophilia in the context of the slave trade? And was there another reason besides them living long that they were also bringing children right. from the continent? And then my second question is, um, I know that there's like Roma, Gypsy, communities in Cuba, mm -hmm. were they at all enslaved or treated in, in, in ways, or, you know? Oh, I didn't know. No. I, I didn't know, though. Okay. Uh, but regarding, uh, thank you for your question, regarding the first question, the, the example that we were mentioning before, the Jesus Maria, that slave ship that was captured in the 1840s, all this, we know about what happened. We know that there were so many kids there because all the girls were systematically raped during the Middle Passage. So they had to, they went to Cuba, they went to the Mixed Commission Court, captured the ship, liberated the, the, the girls and the boys. Explain what the Mixed Commission is. Right, the Mixed Commission is a international court, someone called one of the Friends of Human Rights, that, that the British established in different ports in the Americas, in Freetown, in Brazil, in Cuba. And it was composed by, it was, the members were one Spanish member, one British member, and every time a slave ship was captured, they brought the slave ship there to be condemned, and the slaves were declared free or liberated. So, liberated. So, the slaves, this, this mixed commission, they captured this, the British Navy, they captured close to Havana, this slave ship coming from Africa. And when they come to Havana with the ship, they liberated all these slaves, and the, the kids start talking about what they experienced in the Middle Passage, because part of the legal process was interviewing the victims. And the kids are saying that they were, the girls are saying that they were systematically raped. the boys either? Raped. I don't have her reference of a boy's rape, but they were systema systematically saying they were, were raped. They Spain didn't care. They kept two boys. They kept two boys. And they were um, raped and their, um, with their testimony, not in Havana, but in the Middle Passage. Yes. And they took right. the slaves from Havana and mm -hmm. then they got testimony and they can find it online. But you know, they took it to Havana, so they took it to Brazil because when they testified in Havana, nobody cared. The, Span the Cuban, the Spanish government said they, they didn't care. So they sent it to Nassau, and only after they testified there, then the British had pressured the Cuban government, the Spanish government, to do something about it. They never did anything about it. And they knew who were the perpetrators. And then they would, when they liberated the slaves, they would go to Freetown. In, in the case they were captured in Africa, they went to Freetown. In the case they were captured in Havana, they, they remained in Havana, or they were sent to other uh, West Indies. And they remained as a sort of period of apprenticeship, yeah. supposedly for seven years, but sometimes it took their whole life. So basically, right. so for some s form of uh, slavery under different name. Because remember, slavery wasn't abolished in the British Empire until 1834. Yes. Oops. Uh, Jorge, thank you for this really um, incredible um, presentation. I just the tables and the facts are just mind blowing. Um, so I have sort of two kinds of questions. One is um, about the sort of contemporary um, politics of knowledge creation about this, these facts. You know, I mean, it seems like uh, some of what you've displayed here is a sort of potential threat to a notion of a certain kind of Cuban nationalist ideology. And I'm curious, you know, how work like this is received in the field? Um, are there particular locations um, uh, that resist 
the work that you're doing. Um, so then sort of secondary to that question is a question about um, sort of following up on Marielle's question about is the revolution a reparation? Now, I, I obviously don't really know, but um, I am curious about whether or not the benefits of the revolution you feel have accrued evenly um, across the sort of racialized population in Cuba, so specifically black Cuban. So that's, mm -hmm. that's a question. So those are the sort of two questions about politics of knowledge and race. And secondly, I'm, I'm really interested in um, you know, this wider field of international actors that um, you, know, you highlight in your work. And I think about, you know, I work on uh, Indo-Caribbean's descendants of indenture. So indenture is happening you know, from 1830 onward. And so I'm curious about the relationship between um, the sort of institutional management in the international arena of indenture while sort right. of, uh, you know, uh, slave trade is occurring simultaneously. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank I you don't for the question. Um, I have never, I don't, uh, that's something interesting. I, ha I don't know how my, uh, this, first of all, these studies are pretty recent. Marali Lesser has been organizing different conferences in Havana. The, probably one of the engine of this new studies is Marial. Um, but I have never had the opportunity ever to present this in Cuba. No, not because I, no, because there is any prohibition about it. Just because I have never had the opportunity. I was going to a conference that my Marial organized three years ago, but my Cuban passport didn't arrive on time, so I don't have I don't have a reaction. But I can what I can tell is that the state of the historiography in Cuba, they are reproducing many of the myths that we were talking here. Like for example, not, not long ago, a Cuban historian published a book on slavery, and somehow she justified the slave trader because she said that, oh, that's how things used to be at that point, so it was normal. But in reality, it's the 19th century, so slavery was wrong, morally, politically, and legally. So they knew what they were doing. But regardless, we still repeat some of this myth about slavery. So regarding to the indenture question, which is really interesting, is that when the slavery was being abolished and it was clear that the African market was going to close at any time, uh, the Cuban white elites start bringing people from other places, like the Culias, for example, from China. Uh, but the people who were doing that, transporting them from there, were the same as slave traders. They were doing both things at the same time. They were, okay, this business is closed, now let's grab people from this other area because it's legal. The British are not te te technically they are free, so they, there is a working contract. So we're going to bring them. For example, Julian Sulueta, he was one of the main uh, slave traders during the period of illegally, and simultaneously he was bringing coolies from China. So they, that transition they continue, and then in the 20th century, the descendant of them, when they, there was no more Chinese, they start bringing Jamaicans and Haitians. Mm. So they were bringing people of color, and, and Africans and the descendants since the beginning of time. And those are the people that at the end had to leave Cuba. That's why somehow it's a reparation. Thank you. You're welcome. I, and uh, I'm an outsider, uh, and I've only been going to Cuba for nine years. But to answer your second question, no. That the, the, the myth of that the revolution wiped out anti-black racism Cuba is Bullshit. I mean, if you look at the power structure of the Castro government, the su successful Castro government, whatever you would call an upper middle class of the communist society, the ruling power, whatever term you want, it is overwhelmingly white or light. And the poorest, darkest, most African people are the, uh, I mean, the most phenotypically African people dominate the poorest people. Now my wife will say everything I just said is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Could you give Marielle a microphone? <laughs> I guess I, I know better. <laughs> no, I'm, you know, I agree, kind of, <laughs> but uh, you had to admit that uh, providing education for free and healthcare for free for everybody, they did uh, big time, uh, you know, reparation for slavery, and uh, it's kind of, you know, the the economy is very bad in Cuba. The educational system is not, you know, in good health. The same with the healthcare, but they did a big effort, and you can see that in numbers. You know, the expectation of life 
of black people in Cuba is as long as white people because we go to the same hospital, get the same health care, and we used to go to the same school. I went to school, it was an experiment, a boarding school in early 70s. Uh, my, the name of the school was Vladimir Ilich Lenin. I went to school with ca Castro kids, two boys. Uh, we went to the same uh, classes. And it was a pretty integrated school. I, I, bel I believe that at least uh, 25% of the students were black or mixed. Uh, that was more or less the, the you know, the amount of the population. The of the population. And uh, it is gone. I was teaching uh, in Havana for 25 years. When I started teaching in the 80s, my students were, you know, representing the average population of Cuba. At the end of my years in 2010, they were getting wider and wider and wider because parents start to pay for tuition, extra tuition, you know. So the parents who had money were able to support the kids and uh, the kids were getting admitted in the University of Havana. And I was complaining and they said, you know, we, are, we have a, a colorblind polity here. Uh, we don't recognize races. We even don't track who is black and who is, so uh, there's nothing that we can do. Uh, but, so you are right, uh, but. I, I accept that. Yeah. No, the, the idea that you would get, give free medicine to everybody and free education is remarkable and obviously disproportionately benefited the people at the bottom who were disproportionately black. There's no question about that. But the, the well, you know, name uh, the slave museum. What's the most famous slave museum in Cuba? Zero. Zero. <laughs> they have tried to erase the memory of slavery, man. You know, <laughs> people like Mary Allen Jorge are trying to, but they, people want to wipe them out. They go, what are you talking about? You've been over there with these gringos too much. We didn't really have slavery, and it was different, and it was humane. Even Alejandro romanticizes, and I love it. My colleague, even he romanticizes the relationship uh, many aspects of the savior. Yes. Okay, I'm, my background is Polish. I spent time in Cuba when I was 20. I'm almost 70. There is r some racism, yet yeah, definitely in Cuba, I've, I found. However, Haitian Creole is considered the second language in Cuba. Um, it's, it's a very, it's valued, the Haitian community in Santiago de Cuba. The people still, the, the, the Cubans, the, who are Haitian background still speak Creole. Um, the government respects the Creole, the Haitians, the Cubans of Haitian descent that are there. So yes, there is there is some racism, but Creole as a language is respected. I, I've been to Santiago de Cuba. I've filmed there. I will not um, answer your question. I'll defer to any Cuban <laughs> who might want to respond. Uh, oh, hey. How are, we talking, are we talking about Santiago or Creole? Um, um, uh, I think I think the thing is um, uh, Santiago, the, the the eastern side of uh, Cuba, has a more uh, African African descended population than in Havana, and it has to do with because uh, partially because of the Haitian Revolution, some of them were moved there and built up these coffee plantations, and then during the 20th century there was a bunch of Haitians that were brought to Cuba as part of this indentured labor that we were talking before. And yeah, I have heard that there is a community. You know, me personally, I have never been to Santiago. I grew up in Cuba for 30 years. I have never been to Santiago de Cuba, which is ridiculous. The Creole is considered the second language, right? I, I, I'm not, I, Maria? That's not true. I don't know. Mass is considered the second language here in the South. But, uh, hey, I'm not sure about it. That, that's not true, madam. I don't understand what that means. Creole is not considered the second language of Cuba. Uh, Mary Al has oh, been a Mary professor at the University of Vannan for 25 years, and she just said no. It, that's not true. It's not. Well, the Haitian government, the Cuban government said it is. Um, that's what they have Right. Well, I'll tell you what. You send us the footnote on that, okay? okay. All right, that's good. Um, okay, so I also wanted to say thank you so much for this presentation. It was awesome. I had a comment and then a question that may be a little redundant after 
something that Skip and um, Marielle just pointed out. So my comment is just I wanted to commend you on how you use these um, very individual stories and marry them with statistics. As a fellow historian, that's something that we don't always remember to do and don't always do well. Mm -hmm. And you did an amazing job of that. It really made the story come alive. So I really appreciated that. Um, so my question was, and the part of it that was just answered was about the memory of um, slavery in Cuba today. We've been having these conversations about race relations and uh, whether the revolution kind of was this uh, act of reparations, et cetera. Um, so we have the answer to the question that there are no slavery museums, but I wonder about some of the spaces that you were talking about in your presentation, um, ports where slaves were coming in, uh, the houses of former plantation owners, the plantations themselves. Do we see any kind of memory preserved of these spaces? What's happening with those spaces right, right. now? I know you visited a couple of them. You mentioned a few of them in your presentation, but I just wondered if you could give a broader sense of what's happening with those spaces today. Yeah, um, so in the case of uh, Havana, where most of these slave arrived in the period I'm talking about, the second most important port is Santiago. The, they arrived to what is now Old Havana, or Colonial Havana. So the, what, the person who used to be the historian, who used to be for a long, long time, and he is, to be, he is still the official historian of Havana, um, the office of the his Oficinal Historiador, I would never know how to, it's an institution, he's like the voice, the official voice of the history of this region. So he had programs, he had TV shows, he, he published books, and that guy is obsessed only and exclusively with the white planters. He only talk about the houses and the wealth and the greatness and the smartness and the brilliant how pe these people are, how they founded the nation. And the founding fathers of the Cuban nation, intellectually speaking, are the, the slave planters and the slave traders. And this, there is not any official recognition whatsoever that those big houses, those palaces in O'Havana, all these streets were made with slave labor. He never talked about it. So it's not part of the picture. And that can be extended to other cases. There are historians in Cuba who work on slavery. There have been historians in Cuba who work on slavery since the 1930s. A scattering, and no, not many of them, but some of them do. But officially, I would say that there is a lot of work that needs to be done to put things in the perspective how they really were, I think. Um, so Jorge, I'll just kind of echo what others have said about the kind of richness of your project. It's really stunning and really wonderful to sort of see somebody, you just received your PhD. This is really, really impressive. Um, so I wanted you to talk a little bit about your archival process. You opened mm -hmm. with kind of discovering your love of the archive. What kinds of archives are you working in? Right. And I think for me, this, this kind of moment of kind of circulating expertise between sort of Cuban <coughs> traders and Americans, how does that actually show up in the archival documents? Because I found that right. to be a really powerful claim, but I'm, I'm wondering like, how do you actually sort of where, find that yeah, in the documents? Yeah, where is coming from? Um, so I, I, I found like many years ago, I was working with Carmen Barcia, this document in the archive, in Cuba archive about this, the first slave ship that was captured. And I remember bringing it to Marial, and we thought that the place says Rio Con Congo, but in reality it was River Pongo. We didn't know even what River Pongo was. We so we started, we thought it was Congo because what is Pongo? That probably well, is, is a misspelling. Such a place doesn't exist. And one day Marial shows, oh, there is this guy who works, he knows everything about Rio Pongo, that's a thing. And then I started working on that, uh, gathering more and more information, digitizing records from Cuba, from Cuba custom records, legal cases, notaries, and I was building this story of the story of these slave traders. And then I had the opportunity when I moved to the United States, new documents where I had the opportunity to go to other places like England, for example, and work with the records that resulted of the capture of these slave ships. So these, the, all these slave ships, 60 of them, that were captured between 1790 and 1820, we, Maria and I, digitized these records, and we worked with them, uh, processing this this vast amount of information, also the parliamentary paper, the foreign office records, documents of legal cases in the United States, local documents from Spain, such as the, all these institutional level of discussions, uh, the British pushing the Spanish to abolish the slave trade, so that's also in the British archive, but it's also, and the most interesting experience was how you put all these documents to speak to each other. So you have documents from Cuba, you have documents from the United States, you have from, from Spain, but they're talking about this Africa, also from Sierra Leone. 
They're talking about the same thing in the same period. So basically, uh, we put all these documents together and there is a whole universe of documents sending all across the Atlantic, the, like a policing, policing thing that documents going, going from Spain to, to England and then to the United States and moving around. That's why mm. we need a website. We have like 800 gigabytes of document digitized of all about around the Atlantic world right now. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, oh, did you? I just wanted to add a footnote of this fascinating uh, dialogue between husband and wife. <laughs> I love both of them deeply, and they're both right. But, but I, I do think that, I mean, we know that every government lies to rationalize the forms of structures of domination that serve as the, the basis of it, right? And we know at the same time that every nation has been rooted in forms of barbarism. Yeah. Definitely. No matter what. No matter. Mm -hmm. But one fact, and this is a crucial footnote, and this is part of the greatness of the Cuban people, no matter what color they are. And no rationalization for the repression and all of the uh, mistreatment of our precious dissenting voices. But when you have the most wealthy, the most powerful empire in the history of the world, demonized, massive sanctions, massive boycotts, military invasions, trying to assassinate their leaders, mm -hmm. and they still can feed their people and provide free access to education. That's not a small thing. That's not a small thing. White supremacy is still at work in Cuba. They've been lying. Q Castro and all of them lying, because I went there and said that to them and called me a counter-revolutionary. I said, that's a compliment. <laughs> in the name of Jesus. That's a compliment. But the point is, <laughs> because I'm telling the truth there, but I tell the truth about America. So that this footnote is, a, is the framework mm -hmm. that is important to keep in mind. You see what I mean? So the truth telling that you all are able to do it is so courageous and actually the Cuban government doesn't want to hear just like American government don't want to hear about the, the ugly realities here, you see. But I just want to keep that, 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 that footnote in mind because the American empire does bear some responsibility, not full because the Cubans make their own decisions. Mm -hmm. They repress each other in their own way. They hate, not, they not treat each other right in their own way. But this larger framework is an important thing mm -hmm. in this magnificent intra-family dialogue, <coughs> as well as the intra-academy and, and, and a dialogue about the complexities of the relation of slavery to Cuba and how, in fact, they've been able to try to move forward and the contemporary politics that, that does affect it. But do you accept that, my brother? Cause yeah, I, actually, I will add to this. Um, uh, the Republic, part of the Republican esta uh, establishment in Miami, those who are the people who flee Cuba, flee Cuba in the 1960s, who, ha who are in support Trump, who are extremely conservative, are also extremely racist, yeah. and they also want, uh, the, I think that part of the pressure that they have over Cuba it is elite perspective that those who were below us took control of the island, and that included a very racialized perspective. So I think that this is part, all this is connected. All this is connected since the United States until now. All this is connected, and Miami is uh, some sort of echo chamber of what happened in Cuba. They went to Cuba and to Miami, and they tried to, find, to establish their own white Cuba. And that's why they, they, they fit so nicely, so, uh, certain logics of racism in this country too. That, that's why they fit like, you ask Cuba, they're not Latino, they're white. In Miami, no way, they are white. And that's the, the story they concur with. They are Trump supporters, hardcore Trump supporters. Yeah, that's, that's Miami. I don't feel like I can follow up with that. <laughs> um, I really appreciated this. And, um, I thought about sugar. Um, when I was writing A Taste for Brown Sugar, I kind of went back to thinking about sugar and the relationship of sugar to blackness. And I was really inspired by, you know, Sidney Mintz's work and others working on, um, the, yeah, sweetness and power. Um, and mm -hmm, and that way, I guess my question was, you know, the 
this, um, the hundreds of thousands of people that were brought to Cuba, ostensibly for the sugar trade, although I imagine that they did a lot of work in actually building Havana, building the infrastructure mm -hmm. of the island and many other industries, but tobacco. tobacco. How did the sugar industry, I mean, I don't know if you have statistics on that, but how did it, it kind of um, grow and respond and kind of consume those bodies? And I was also interested in if you had any information about the innovations and the expertise to manage the work of those populations. When I understand sugar was one of the most debilitating forms of work, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, during that time in terms of from cutting it, but especially in the mill work, mm -hmm. and that there was often a person who was in charge of, um, like usually sometimes a child with a stick who had to stop the machine to get the limbs mm -hmm. of, the, li the machines would eat the limbs of the enslaved right. workers and they would have to take the limbs out with right. a stick. Um, so it was extremely debilitating and in thinking about empire and debility um, and the use of black bodies mm -hmm. in this way, I'm interested in how you saw capital exploit and respond to that and what were the kind of global implications of then that trade that then expands based on sugar. Wow, oh, that's a lot of things to compare. Sorry, in a small way, no, in, a, in a final question, question way. <laughs> thank you. Uh, no, thank you for uh, for your question. You first mentioned something about the transfer of expertise, and that's a global, uh, let's say, the beginning of capitalism, the expansion of capitalism in the late 18th century, and in part it has to do precisely with the Haitian Revolution. Most of the expertise that uh, Cubans acquired, how to process sugar, build the industries, every single details about the machinery. And um, that those were the people, because all this is connected, people migrating from places to other to keep doing their horrible, horrible business. Mm -hmm. So they flew, those who could survive the Haitian Revolution, the Saint Domingue, they went to Cuba, and with them, they brought expertise, not only the translated slave trade, but also in the sugar production. And partially, all the expansion of the sugar production that happened, partially, not fundamentally, the expansion of the sugar production that happened in the, in the 18th century has part of the origins there. And by the 1830s, Cuba was the main producer of sugar in the world. You mentioned a number before. Uh, I, I was talking about the slave, so I said 980,000 nine, slaves were carried to Cuba, almost a million. There is still data missing. So I would say that saying a million would be uh, inaccurate. But you have to add to those all the industrial labor that happened in the second half of the 19th century and the first half of the 20th century to part of this process of uh, expansion of the sugar industry. And by the 1950s, you want to see the connections while Jamaicans were cutting the, the sugar cane in the plantation, Hersey, the, sugar produ the chocolate producer here in the United States, went to Cuba and established his own town. And the business, and this is a moment also where the United Fruit Company is going to Cuba. This is a moment, and they are big, the people, who, some cases are not Cuban, they are Americans there, with the multi-corporations bringing Africans or their descendants, in this case African descendants, for other islands in the Caribbean, as indentured labor. Why? Why? black people, because the white people think that, that they don't, that their that work is not for them. Because they were convinced for years that, that that's the type of work that only black people can do. So they start importing all these places from all the Caribbean. And so it's all is part of a whole global process of growth, like you call capitalism, if you want. Yeah. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs>